Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients titled What Kidney Patients Need to Know This Flu Season. My name is Erin Kale and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics and Advocacy. I oversee our patient research and education activities as well as our grassroots engagement activities including our ambassador initiative, which comprises highly motivated and engaged patients, caregivers, and living kidney donors around the country and the globe. These individuals have a direct connection to kidney disease and wish to raise awareness and provide support to others navigating the challenges of this chronic disease. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives, and we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic and private sector research, shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. We encourage you to take part in our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities as they come your way. At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Stephen Fadum is chair of AAKP's Medical Advisory Board, and he is a champion for chronic kidney disease education. He is a clinical professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, section of nephrology. Dr. Fadum attended Tulane University and graduated the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. After he completed his internship and residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center, MD Anderson and Herman Hospitals, he did a renal fellowship at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Dr. Fadum was one of the first doctors to discover the value of the internet for patient education and founded several websites dedicated to public service and the dissemination of clinical information. He has participated heavily in the development of and revisions of numerous AAKP patient education materials, including the patient plan series and the kidney beginnings, a patient's guide to living with reduced kidney function. Dr. Fadum is the recipient of the National Kidney Foundation's Distinguished Service Award, the AAKP Visionary Award, the AAKP Peter Lundeen MD Award, the AAKP Medal of Excellence, and the President's Volunteer Service Award. Dr. Fadum is listed in America's Top Doctors. He serves as editor of AAKP Renal Life magazine and as historian for AAKP. Thank you so much, Dr. Fadum, for joining us today to share information about preparing for flu season this year. I'll now turn things over to you. Well, thank you very much. And um, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to talk to you about a, a subject which is very, very important. And um, so we'll begin uh, with the first slide. We're going to talk about what you need to know about the flu. And, uh, and I think this slide sums it up. And that is we're, we're talking about getting a flu shot. Uh, we're also talking about wearing a mask uh, when appropriate and uh, staying healthy. And uh, you'll see why as the talk develops. The flu virus is not something that you, now we think about the flu and we say, oh, no big deal, we have the flu. But you have to understand a hundred years ago, what happened with the flu. It was a very serious illness. It spread around the world, mainly with World War I. It weakened the troops uh, that were fighting in World War I. And after the war, the president of the United States at the time, who refused to wear a mask, became ill with the flu while he was negotiating uh, treaties at Versailles, trying to help 
the United States with Germany and, uh, and try to get peace reestablished. And because Woodrow Wilson was sick, the plans didn't go as they should have. And some of the turmoil related to uh, the aftermath of World War I was because, could be directly related to the fact that President Wilson had a severe case of the flu and uh, it made him very sick. Back in those days, they didn't really know what the flu was. They didn't know if it was bacteria or not. It killed millions and millions of people. It was a pandemic. It was as bad as COVID is today. And right now it affects people under 50 years old most commonly, but it can help, it can spread to the oldsters like me. It's like COVID, it spreads by tiny droplets of moisture from person to person when we talk to each other when we sneeze and when we cough. And like COVID, it goes about six feet and then drops off. You know when you have the flu, you just feel lousy. You have a headache, a runny nose, cough. You feel achy and fatigued. You don't want to do anything. You just want to go to bed. And uh, you're going to be sick with the flu generally the first three to four days and it's gonna run its course, it's gonna be self-limited. Most people are gonna get well, they'll feel good, they'll go back to our uh, work. We recommend that if you have the flu, you not exercise during that period of time because the virus can affect your heart and can cause uh, inflammation in the heart. And if you're exercising during that time, you can have arrhythmias and get very, very sick. Some people who get the flu have a rough course. Some of the things about the flu are that it can lead to a, a more serious disease. Now, one of the excellent questions that, that somebody wrote in was, how do I know I have the flu and not a more serious disease? Well, unfortunately, you may have a more serious disease or I may have a more serious disease and may think I have the flu, uh, it can lead to pneumonia. And many of the people, especially many of you who are on this call are either elderly or you have a chronic underlying disease like kidney disease or diabetes or high blood pressure, or you've had a kidney transplant. And if you're immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, your immune system doesn't work that well. And you can have other infectious problems that can be confused with the flu. There have been several clinical studies that, that your doctor can do, several blood tests that your doctor can do to determine whether you have pneumonia, whether you have another condition or not. And both the COVID-19 and the influenza can cause similar symptoms, a fever, cough, achiness, vomiting, diarrhea, pneumonia, and the symptoms with both diseases can be mild to uh, unfortunately even fatal. Transplant patients have a decreased response to vaccines and most dialysis patients are also uh, can be non-responders to vaccinations. We certainly see this with hepatitis. Well, this is the anatomy of the flu. This is what the flu looks like. And we need to keep in mind these two big red ovals uh, because you're gonna hear about the flu and someone's gonna say, well, I've had H1N1 or H3N2 or H5N5. You're gonna say, well, what does this mean? Well, these are antigens that are um, on the flu, on the virus. And one is a hemagglutinin antigen, the other is a neuraminidase antigen. So these are substances that are on the virus and your body responds to those by creating an antibody. So when you get the flu shot, the flu shot may be against H, that's what the H stands for, for the hemagglutinin, N, stands for the neuraminidase. So the flu vaccine may be targeted against actual 
proteins or antigens that sticks off the, uh, the virus. So this is what the virus looks like. And these are the two things to remember, the hemagglutinin and the neuromenides. Over the last hundred years, we started with uh, flus. The worst flu, of course, was 1919, 1920, 1921, started in 1918 died down and had several other peaks. And uh, some people think it had over 100 million fatalities. It was really, really bad. And it was called the Spanish flu. And uh, so it was really one of the worst. And then in 1990, 1977, we had another flu. This too was an H1M1. Remember what we talked about. And that was the Russian flu. Now, between then, we had the H3N2. We had the bird flu and the H2N2, and that was very scary. And that in Asia, a lot of the people that live in uh, the farms in Asia, the, the, uh, the birds go in and out of where they live. So they're in constant contact with birds. And this disease can be spread by birds. So we can we talk about the bird flu, and it can also be spread from swine, so uh, barnyard animals. Now there is a virus that's spread from cows, so that's called mad cow disease. That's not a flu, but that's a very serious illness that can cause severe brain damage. And uh, but you can see that. This has been extensively studied, and there have been several of the neuromenides and several of the hemagglutinins that have been associated with the flu. Today, there was a newspaper report about COVID-19, the Omicron variant. And they said, within a few days, we'll have a new booster, maybe 85 days. Now, when you think about it, that is just amazing. That is just simply amazing because when you look at what happened in 1900, and we've had the virus, we've had vaccines since the 1700s. George Washington was telling his troops to get vaccinated against smallpox. But when you think about the flu, they didn't even know it was a virus for several years. And then it wasn't until the 1940s that we actually had a flu virus, a flu vaccine. Look at what happened with polio. We didn't have polio vaccines until the 1950s. And we haven't had um, the yellow fever vaccine. Look when that started. And that took years to develop. Uh, chicken pox. Um, that certainly, there was no chicken pox vaccine when I was a little boy. There was no pneumonia vaccine until I was in training. And hepatitis B, uh, we now have a cure for hepatitis C. So we've made some amazing advancements in science when it comes to vaccines. And I don't know what you're listening to on the news, if you can really call it news. I use that term loosely. But vaccines are good. And don't let anybody fool you and say they're not good. The vaccines are good. They prevent millions of deaths each year. Even with the flu, they present, prevent millions of cases. So vaccines are very, very good to keep people from getting a serious illness. Let's talk about influenza A and influenza B. Influenza A that we know today is H1N1 or H3N2. Influenza B can either be the Victoria strain or the Yamagata strain. We do not use the H1N1 notation 
for influenza B. Influenza A is more common and serious. If you get flu, there's a higher chance you're going to get influenza A. The trivalent shots only worked on one of the influenza Bs and both influenza A's. The new variant uh, vaccines are all quadrivariant, all quadrivalent, and they work against H1N1 and H3N2, the influenza A's, and both strains, the Victoria and the Yamagata uh, strains of influenza B. So that's why we call them quadrivalent. They're against all four strains. Another question, this is a survey. What measures spread the flu? And this is the answers that we got. 75 to 77% of people thought it was one of the five things, four things. Hand washing, covering your face when you sneeze or cough, staying away from people who are sick, or the vaccination. And that's what the opinion was, and you're all correct. And why are you correct? Do we have any evidence that you're correct? The answer is yes. This is a, a mask being worn in a Louis Vuitton store. Um, it, you can wear your mask everywhere and should. If you're in public, if you're out in a shopping center, if you're at a party, and if you don't know the people there, or there are more than a few people there, wear your mask. You can either wear your surgical mask like I have here. Uh, you can wear the N95 mask, or you can wear the, the Chinese version of the N95 mask, which is a lot more comfortable and the straps go in a different direction. I have a mask collection. It's very important. And guess why? Because the influenza spread fell dramatically this last year. And it fell because we were wearing our masks, because we didn't have schools where kids could catch the disease. And even though that wasn't a good thing for education, it was a good thing for decreasing the spread of influenza. We socially distanced. Most of us stayed home. We were under house arrest. We didn't go out very much. And then we were very careful. We, um, after we were able to finally find the Perel, we started buying it and washing our hands, sanitizing our hands more frequently. So basically being more careful has paid off. And the symbol of being careful is wearing the mask. So we've done a good job of trying to be careful, and I think we should continue to do so. Despite social distancing, wearing a mask, hand washing, and the most important thing you can do is get the flu shot. And it's critical if you're vulnerable, if you're a kidney patient, you need to get the flu shot. It's very critical. The flu shot is gonna help prevent seven million illnesses 3.7 million medical visits, 109,000 hospitalizations, and 8,000 deaths. It's painless. You saw I got mine in public. I, I went in the middle of the dialysis unit and got mine, and it was all over Facebook because I wanted to set an example. If people would tell me it's really dangerous to get the flu shot, and I was on Facebook having gotten it, I could confidently say to them, what are you talking about? If it was dangerous, I wouldn't have gotten it. I'm not gonna do anything dangerous. But the fact that I got it meant that I believed in it, I trusted it, and I'm glad I did because people around me are getting the flu and I, I feel great. Uh, I think I recommend the flu shot. And I think you're on the right track for it anyway, so keep doing it. In fact, I'm really preaching to the choir because of the people uh, that I'm talking to, oh, 
over 90% of people either have gotten it or they're going to get it. It's just a matter of logistics, you know, going to your dialysis unit, getting it there, going to CVS or going over to Walgreens, just basically finding a place to go to get it. And, uh, but that's pretty good. 90% are going to get it. And, um, I don't know if the other eight enjoy having the flu or what, but you know, I, I personally think it should be a hundred percent. I don't know anybody that should, that wouldn't want to get the flu shot. Does everyone in your household get the flu shot? Well, 75% said yes. And, uh, three, 3.6% were honest and said they didn't know. 21.1% said no. Uh, if you have people in your household that aren't going to get the flu shot, you might want to tell them to get it for your sake. Because if you're immunosuppressed and they get the flu, then they could give it to you. And uh, so in, in between the time that you get the flu shot, you develop your immunity you can get sick. So, you know, they should get the flu shot just so they don't get you sick. Okay, there are four types of flu, as we mentioned, alluded to. There's one of the four types. Well, the first one begins with A. So the four types are A, B, C, and D. Now, we almost never see C, and I don't think we've ever seen D in humans. I don't think D even can affect humans. A mutates easily and lives in wild birds, like this fella here who flies back and forth between Venezuela and America. These birds migrate, then they leave here, they go up to Canada. They migrate all over the place. So they can easily bring us a virus. It's very easy for them to spread the virus. And there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Now the bee, the Victoria, the Yamamata, don't mutate as much, but A mutates like crazy. And so knowing that, we basically want to change the flu shot each year so that it will meet what the needs of the community are. And so the flu shot you take this year may not be the same flu shot that you took last year. Now, remember the vaccines used to be trivalent or quadrivalent. Now they're all quadrivalent. So now they include the Yamagata strain as well as the Victoria, the H1N1, and the H3N2. And all, all of them are um, quadrivalent. Now people will say, well, what is a recombinant? Well, that's a synthetic flu shot, and it's not grown in eggs. Why not? Well, you may not be allergic to the flu shot, but you may be... When you have your reaction, it may be that you're allergic to eggs. So if you're allergic to eggs, then that can cause a problem. And so we have a shot for you. It's called the recombinant flu. Now, the other type of shot that you're going to hear about is the live flu shot that you can inhale. Don't take it. You do not want the live flu shot. Just to review, you have your egg shot. You have your high dose egg shot for the older people. You've got your, um, your high dose uh, uh, adjuvant uh, will produce a stronger immune response. And uh, so you have your quadrivalent, which is high dose. And then you have one with a little kicker in it, something that makes it stronger. And then you have a recombinant vaccine, which is not egg based. And then you have the weakened bacteria uh, shot, which you don't want to take. And then if you had a terrible muscular disorder, neuromuscular disorder called Guillain-Barre syndrome, you really shouldn't take it for the first six weeks. In fact, I don't, uh, because I was on the original case, one of the original cases of Guillain-Barre, this was back in 1970, I think it was 78, uh, and I was involved when it first was discovered to occur in Guillain-Barre, the flu shot caused it. And I was involved in that. I took care of that patient. So I, I'm not recommending the flu shot for Guillain-Barre patients. I'm not going to repeat all of these 
countries uh, where the virus comes from, the egg-based and the, uh, the recombinant have, are made with recommendations. And the recommendations come from a committee and the committee decides based on information which flu shot's gonna be the most common. And that's the one that, that will, they will give us. So if you're over 65, you want to take uh, the high dose quadrivalent shot. And the one available where I work is called Fluzone. And I'm not in the interest of full disclosure. I have nothing to do with Santa Fe. Uh, and I don't really care which brand you take. This is just the one we had available. And so because we had it available, I was able to take a picture of it. So this is called flu zone, and it's the high dose one. This is called the flu silvax, and this is the quadrivalent, but it's not as strong. So it's for the people that are under 65. It's for you youngsters. This is the one that we recommend for the, the younger people. What we want to do is we want to take this if we're younger. But when we get older, we want to take the flu zone. And the important thing is to take something. This is what the flu virus looks like. And uh, it kind of looks like Africa. And uh, so that leads us to our next subject. I don't think I can get away with talking about the flu shot and not mention the Omicron variant, which is in the news constantly. And you have read and heard all kinds of stuff about the Omicron. And um, some of it is, is garbage, and some of it is true. It's an evolving subject, and every day we learn something new. There was a study that came out a few days ago that talked about how people who had the two vaccines, but didn't have the third, were more likely they would get it. And it was, a, uh, it was uh, Omicron was uh, affecting younger people. And Delta was an earlier variant, and it was very aggressive, and it came out of India. And it quickly spread around the world because it was more infective and more competitive it could compete with its other viruses and spread faster. Luckily, it wasn't as harmful because uh, a virus doesn't want to be harmful. If the virus kills people right away, then it doesn't spread because the, the host dies. The, a dead host doesn't spread the disease. That's why you want to have, if you're a virus or you're a plague or you're a a bug, you want to, number one, you want to have a place for it to reside. So in this case, it's birds. But with the flu, with the, um, the uh, COVID, it was bats, perhaps. And with the bubonic plague, it was rats. And it was uh, lice that carried a little Yersinia pestis. So you want to have some sort of vector and host where it can live and where it can spread. And that's important. The second thing is you don't want it to be too lethal because if it's really lethal, then it'll kill people and it won't spread. That's what happens with Ebola. Ebola was so lethal that people would die so rapidly that it wouldn't spread. Can you imagine if Ebola wasn't that lethal. It would go all over the, the world very rapidly. Or can you imagine if it had a long incubation period? That's the trouble with COVID is it has a five day incubation period. So the COVID was very, very infective, but it wasn't very harmful. And the Omicron looks to be the same thing. It's even more infective because it's got more of the alterations in the spike that cause it to be infective, but it's not as um, dangerous. Now we say that, but we don't say that for sure because in South Africa, they studied it mainly in a younger population, but 
having been to South Africa and having been here, we are an older population in America. Uh, when I hang out with my friends, we're all a lot older. We're, we're not as young a country. South Africa has a lot more young people in it. And so they're not going to do as poorly with a virus as we are. So it's not fair to say that the virus is safer. It's just to say that it occurred in a younger, healthier population. So we don't think Omicron is as bad. Now, the South African population either didn't get vaccinated or they got two vaccines. And by now, most of us in, um, have gotten the third vaccine. And if you haven't, as soon as I finish talking, get it. Talk to your drugstore or your dialysis unit or wherever you go and get yourself set up to get the booster. The booster, it seems, according to the latest studies, will protect you against the Omicron virus, at least from having a bad course of it. You may have a mild course and just kind of feel bad, go to bed for a night, but you're not going to be as sick as the people that had the original uh, 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 COVID who were dying, who were in the hospital, who had respiratory failure. So the uh, Omicron variant comes from South Africa. It has a threefold increase in the risk for infection when compared with previous strains. It um, has breakthrough infections, which means you can have the, the vaccine and still get sick. But evidently, if you've had the booster, your course will be very, very mild. It has similar mutations to beta and gamma, but it may be more resistant than the delta to the vaccine. So two doses probably won't protect you. So I predict that the uh, Omicron is gonna spread throughout the United States very, very rapidly. I, I say that with confidence because back in 2020, we were at the livestock show in Houston, Texas. And uh, they were talking about one case in Houston. And we were hoping that they wouldn't come to the med center, which of course they immediately did. And uh, within a matter of months, Houston was totally infected with the uh, COVID-19 virus, even though we started with only one case. And that's the way it is here right now. We have that, as far as I know, only one case in Houston, but by the time, you know, by tomorrow, or the next day, we'll probably have a lot more cases. And I track this each day. So um, I'll probably get a report later today that we have several cases of Omicron in Houston. And I expect it will overtake Delta. The big concern is breakthrough infections. And so on high hospitalization rates, and the secret to that is to get the booster. And this is very, very recent. It just came out a few days ago. And uh, it's not in a peer-reviewed journal. It's on a, on a server called MedRxIV. And this is a special server that we use. That just, it's sort of like newsflash. It's just the latest information, almost like ticker tape. <laughs> If you remember the good old days when they used to have ticker tapes set in the news and telegrams, this is sort of almost like a telegram service. You get the news right away, but it's not, it's not as peer reviewed as it would be if it were um, in, a, in a journal or, or if it were in a book. These are your questions and some of mine. And uh, I sort of mixed them up so that we could make them more meaningful. I boiled them down to six. Number one, can you get the COVID-19 booster and the flu shot at the same time? Yes. So that will save you a ride. Uh, get one in one arm, the other in the other arm. And uh, they're relatively safe to mix those two shots. In fact, you could get your influenza shot 
and your pneumococcal vaccine at the same time. And I strongly recommend, I wouldn't get all three, uh, but I would definitely make sure that you're, you're well vaccinated. And I'll also recommend the single shot. Does a high dose vaccine lower the rate of hospitalization in the elderly? There was a study done that showed that it did. And is the high dose vaccine better for transplants? Although it's only recommended you know, for people over 65, there was a study which showed that transplant people did a lot better when you gave them the high dose vaccine. So if, you're, if you've had a transplant, try to talk whoever's giving you the shot into giving you the high dose. Are all flu vaccines quadrivalent? Yes, they are. And when will we know more about the Omicron COVID-19 variant? Well, this is very, very dynamic and we're finding out stuff every day. Pfizer and Moderna have promised that they will sequence it, have us a, a vaccine, uh, which is gonna be sensitive to it within a few months. Uh, we'll know more about what happened in South Africa with it. The Israelis are working on it. They too have uh, some cases of it. So you're going to see a lot more information emerge about the Omicron variant. And I think we're going to handle it a lot more efficiently than we handled the, the COVID-19 variant that came out in January of 2020. So I don't think we're going to have to lock down. I think wearing a mask in a public uh, environment, wearing a mask in the airport, the bus station, the Amtrak station, uh, the grocery store, Costco is reasonable. I think you, you have to use common sense and good judgment. If you're going to wear a mask, wear a mask. Don't wear some Billy the Kid bandana. Wear a, a real mask. If you can see me, this is the N95 mask. This is the real McCoy. This is what, there you go. This is what we recommend that you wear in the health profession. It's extremely uncomfortable. It goes over your head and it, it goes, you wear it, it goes like this. And it fits very, very snugly around your nose and it fits very snugly around your cheeks and your jaw. So it will protect you. You won't get the virus as likely, you won't be as likely to get the virus if you wear this. It's uncomfortable, but you get used to it. And uh, you sort of have to, uh, because you don't have a choice if you're in certain environments, you don't want to touch it too much. The ones that have the valve on it that the welders use, you don't wear those in the medical profession. Also, the ones that we wear are waterproof. You don't want to wear the kind that's not waterproof because um, if it gets wet, then this uh, electrostatic mechanism doesn't work. This is all electrostatic. So after you wear it uh, for a day, you're supposed to throw it away. And that's what 3M tells you because they want to sell a lot of these. But it also is true. The best time to wear this is initially and then afterwards, throw it away because it's of no value. It won't protect you as well. Um, the second type is the KN95. This is from China. It's a lot easier to wear, a lot more comfortable. It goes around your ears. You can wear this all day. It has a similar material to protect you, but the edges here are not as tight. So you will get the virus. If you're in an environment, an environment oh, that's a pun. If you're in an environment, an environment, uh, you have a chance to get sick if you're wearing this, but this will protect others around you because this will keep most of the particles that you talk and breathe and 
cough inside your mouth and inside your little space here. So you will not infect other people. That's why we wear these. Same with this. The surgical mask is good for surgeons because you don't get the, uh, the patient infected. This keeps the virus and other bugs inside but it doesn't protect you. So if you're wearing this in Costco and somebody is right next to you, whispering in your ear and coughing and breathing, there's a very good chance that you're going to get sick. And unfortunately, the, the same people that have a higher risk of getting sick are people my age, people in their 70s, who are also hard of hearing. So people come up to you and whisper in your ear and tell you things, and you gotta be careful. So we're not out of this yet, but the same thing that will protect you from COVID will also protect you from uh, the flu, which is good. Okay, what are your take home messages here? Get your flu shot. Number two, Transplant patients should talk about the high dose to their doctor. Number three, don't get the live vaccine. Number four, get the COVID booster. Number five, you can get the booster and the flu shot at the same time. Number six, keep up your guard regarding all of these infections until we're more certain what's going on. Number seven, don't just be an island. Tell everybody you know, be an ambassador to get vaccinated for the flu and COVID-19 and to wash your hands and to uh, social distance and wear a mask when necessary. Continue to do all these things, especially if you're at high risk. So we'll take questions now. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Dr. Fadum. Thank you so much for a, a great presentation. Uh, you covered a lot of the questions that we've received, but there are a couple um, additional questions that we can we can go through now. Okay. Uh, one question is from somebody who is a kidney transplant recipient. They say they take monthly infusions of bolidocept and daily serolimus for immunosuppression. They are part of a study for COVID-19 at Johns Hopkins, and they did not produce antibodies after three doses of the mRNA Moderna vaccine. They are wondering if they should ex expect the same lackluster result from the high dose flu vaccine. The, um, the actual problem is, and it's not just Johns Hopkins, <coughs> Johns Hopkins is giving people Okay, they may be getting certain medicines there, but most of the people with the kidney transplants are getting tacolimus or getting uh, neural or getting something that is an immunosuppressant. And Johns Hopkins studied this extensively, and they were able to report that people who had kidney transplants had a very lackluster response to the original virus uh, vaccine and then they had um, a, a better response to the second one, but not a perfect response. Now, we don't know about the high dose flu vaccine, but I think we can expect a lackluster response to the regular flu shot. That, that study was done. So I think that you, um, whoever is asking the question, probably don't need to beg too hard because your doctors at Johns Hopkins are excellent and they understand this, but many people are gonna have to really try to convince folks that they need the high dose transplant. Uh, if they're a transplant, get the high dose vaccine, even if you're young. And young, of course, you know, if you're under 65 years old, still tell them you wanna get the high dose vaccine. Next question. That was an excellent question, by the way. And, Great, uh, thank you. Our next uh, so I know you touched on this a little bit, but um, we have uh, an audience member who has asked if it's true that as a kidney transplant recipient, 
um, when you get the third COVID shot, you need to wait 28 days before getting the flu shot. No. The recommendation has been to get them at the same time. I don't see why you would need to wait. I mean, the purpose of the vaccine is to stimulate your immune system. So if you have two, if you're, you're going to have a lackluster response. And so if you have a flu shot stimulating your flu, system, flu shot, and then you have another one stimulating it, then you probably have a, a little bit of a adjuvant. I, I would get them both at the same time. Uh, I don't see why you would want to wait. Great, thank you for, for clearing that up. Uh, and we have somebody that's wondering if it's possible to know if you have the flu and if it's viral, or if you have um, more of a bacterial or a fungal infection, or if you have COVID. Uh, it seems like there are a lot of similar symptoms. Um, how does one know what they have uh, without doing a test? Obviously, I would think that they should go to the doctor, but um, is there anything that they should be aware of or look out for? Well, the question is, the answer to the question is, yes, you should go to the doctor, but the real answer is, what's your doctor going to do? And uh, so what your doctor will do when you come to us, when you come to me and say, I feel really, really bad. And I don't know if I have the COVID. I don't know if I have the flu and I don't know what I have. Uh, what your doctor is going to do is he's going to give you a COVID test. And if that's negative, he's going to reassure you that you don't have the COVID. And if you're uh, achy, and you have the typical flu symptoms that you just don't feel well, you've lost your appetite, you're achy, you're sneezing, and you're coughing, he's gonna say, go home, uh, take some Theraflu, go to bed, uh, go to sleep, drink some hot tea with lemon, <laughs> a bowl of chicken soup, and, uh, let me know how you do in the next day or two. And that's the flu. Now, if you say, Doc, I got fever and I really feel bad and I'm coughing really bad and I have chest pain and I'm bringing up copious amounts of sputum, your doctor's going to say, oh my, I'm worried that you may have pneumonia. Let's go over and get a chest x-ray and make sure you don't have an infiltrate in your lungs. Or if you're, he might look at your sputum and he might look at it under the microscope and say, oh my gosh, you've got bugs that I can see. You have bacteria in your sputum. And he might do a culture that, to confirm that. And that would be confirmatory of a bronchitis. Or he might do a blood count. And uh, the T cells, you know, they're very busy and they're very localized. And they may not be, um, they may be going down so you may not have a very high white count with the flu, but with a bacterial infection, your body is stimulated to create a whole bunch of what we call polys. And these are white cells that will go right to the bacteria and they will put out a bleach type substance and kill the bacteria. So your white blood count may be elevated. So when, when you go to the doctor, he might do a blood test to show that your white count is elevated. Or your doctor may say, you know what? <laughs> uh, you don't have a cough. You don't have uh, anything going on, but you have some burning on urination and you feel bad and you run a little low-grade fever. You could have a kidney infection. So there are a million things that the doctor is going to look at. And uh, so if you don't feel good, go to the doctor, go to urgent care. Uh, there's no reason to stay home and be miserable. And uh, if you've got an illness that we can treat and are at least diagnosed, at least if you go to the urgent care, you go to the doctor and we tell you, yeah, you just got a mild case of the flu, go home, go to bed, at least you're reassured. But it's better to be overcautious and reassured than to be undercautious and get really, really sick. And um, I've seen it happen both ways. 
And I can tell you the right thing to do is to go to the doctor if you're not certain. We ha have the slide that goes over that. Let's see if we can go back to it. Just this slide talks about the symptoms of the flu, coughing and sneezing, headache and runny nose. This talks about what can happen. And basically you want to do the COVID test. You can do the influenza test and you can do blood tests that can show the difference. If you're a transplant patient, especially, you need to see the doctor. Thank you so much, Dr. Faden, for spending the afternoon with us and for a great presentation. I'd like to close with a few slides about AAKP. If you're not already a member, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership for patients and family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, you can join online or you can give us a call on the phone. To receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life. We also invite you to follow us on our blog and social media for all the latest news and announcements. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers. We also offer numerous kidney-friendly recipes with details on the nutritional content and which stage of kidney disease those recipes are good for. By visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. You can also order materials by phone. We encourage you to visit our on-demand webpage where you can find educational sessions from our previous events, such as our Global Innovation Summit, our Policy Summit, and our National Patient Meeting. We have a plethora of resources on our coronavirus resource page available at this link or by clicking on the red button from our aakp.org homepage. We'd again like to thank today's speaker, Dr. Stephen Fadum, for sharing information about how to prepare for flu season. We hope everyone will continue to be informed and stay safe and have a happy holiday season.